the members of the planning committee and we've got a democracy officer to, to take the minutes and, and help us through as well. Um, we've got a couple of apologies uh, this evening from Councillor Craghill and Councillor Galvin. Uh, we've also got apologies from uh, Councillor Perrett, who's been substituted by Councillor Webb, so welcome this evening. Um, if I could ask if any members have any declarations of interest. Not seeing any, so uh, on to the minutes of the meeting. Which is held on the 17th of October. Are there any comments or if you're happy for me to sign them as a, a correct record? Let's see a few nods, so I'll take that as uh, we're happy. So there's no uh, general public participation under this item, although we've got speakers later on on the plans list. So um, if we can move straight on to item 4A, which is 6 Garrow Hill Avenue. Thank you, Chair. So this, uh, there's no update for this uh, application. Uh, which is uh, an application for single story side and rear extensions at 6 Garrow Hill Avenue. Let's go through the presentation, which is on the screen. Some photographs of the property, which is uh, an end terrace. Uh, it's outside of the conservation area. Um, at 6 Garrow Hill. Avenue property here, so the extensions to the side and to the rear. And um, a Google Earth view shows the, uh, the the building lines in context. This is the site plan as proposed, so it's shown the extension would line up with the uh, the the, the bust Avenue um, building line established by this terrace here. It has existing floor plans. It's a single, uh, certainly a ground floor, single room depth property, living room, kitchen on the ground floor, three bedrooms and a bathroom on the first floor. And there's the uh, existing elevations. So extension to the side and extension to the rear, all at single story. And there's the proposed elevations. So it wraps around the side and rear of the property. If, any, if you wish to see any of the uh, drawings again, just let me know. Okay. There's no updates on this. There's no updates, no. Okay. Have um, committee members got any questions on the initial drawings? Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, just a couple of points of clarity. Um, so on the proposed floor plan, um, see where the uh, sort of in the middle of the property as proposed, where the, the dining table is, and there's a sort of a white marked bit of the wall there. So between the where the stairs go up and the, the what is the exterior wall. Is, yeah. is that yeah, that, that's the bit, yeah. I was just trying to understand if that's intended that that will be a sort of an entirely open plan L shape, and that that's just kind of marking where the exterior wall of upstairs is, or whether that's something else from I wasn't quite clear my understanding is that the former so that's denoting where that uh, existing rear wall will be taken out um so speaker the applicant yeah I think I think the applicant the applicant is speaking, speaker, so, so I can, I can clarify. clarify just but that was yeah. that was my understanding that that was um that was in the amended plans that was created as a as one big room okay and I have a second, if I, if I may, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know what the percentage increase of the um, footprint is and of the overall volume of the building. We haven't made that calculation. But do we not have a policy around that? Not that I'm aware of. I thought that we 
we talk about proportionality yeah I, and I, we talk about um um subservience but i'm not aware that we have a percentage policy which is expressed as a percentage except in the old green belt policy for green well, belt i was trying to remember whether it was a green belt or whether it there was, was a, a green belt policy which was a 25 percent that, that was specifically in the green belt okay so there's nothing within uh, urban development that would uh, oh. give us a, a kind of a guide as to what was appropriate no there's nothing there Okay, thank you. Okay, any further questions? Can't see any. So, if we can move on then to our public speakers, um, our first speaker is uh, Ben Powell, who's speaking in objection. If you'd like to join us, uh, the centre seat. Um, I think they've explained how the. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah, and you know you've got three minutes to address the committee. I'll give you a warning about thirty seconds. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to make a start in your own time. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Ben Powell, and I'm living on at, at 9 Gary Hill Avenue. Uh, I, I just made some notes I'll read from, if that's okay. Okay, so um, Garrow Hill Avenue is a council development completed yet in the inter interwar period and was carefully designed to provide modest housing at a scale and density that make the area a suitable home for families on lower salaries. Uh, in recent decades, the population density has increased significantly and the community structure eroded by a significant proportion of nearby houses being converted to HMOs. We, we the, um, the residents of Gary Hill Avenue, have submitted complaints. Uh, we now anticipate and fear a second phase of overdevelopment as extensions are added to house more people who will bring more cars and produce more rubbish that the neighborhood is already struggling to accommodate. I do appreciate that the high density that high density housing is a good and necessary thing in some contexts, but it ought to be planned rather than sort of cobbled together on the fly. And it ought to have consent from residents, which we do not have in this situation. I think we have 14 out of 22 residents on Gary Hill Avenue submitting objections. Uh, my neighbor, Martin Emerson, has printed some photos, but I, I think you already have the, the necessary photos showing the design and spacing of the houses they currently are. He wants to highlight especially how, until now, councils have resisted overdevelopment in the form of ad hoc and uncoordinated building, and he hopes the council will continue, continue to do so. Thank you. If you could just bear with us a second, I'll just ask if the committee have got any questions. Um... Which I can't see any, so I'll, I'll thank you for your time this evening, if you could... Uh return to the public gallery thank you uh next then we've got councillor pavlovich i'm sure you know what to do thank you chair i'm speaking as ward councillor on behalf of at least nine other residents of garrow hill avenue who have registered formal objections and many others who haven't formally done so, but are clear that they have huge anxiety about how the nature of their street will change should this application be approved tonight. Those of you who have seen the house, and more importantly the street scene, will have clearly noticed that no other properties have been extended, and this property, uh, this proposal is not a small extension. Its wraparound nature and pitched roof will look totally overwhelming for both those living on Garrow Hill Avenue and those on Barstow Avenue behind it. As the report stated, when a previous extension application at this property was refused in 2008, and I quote, the site is an open and green space, which adds to the character of the area and gives the street scene a more spacious feel. The open field is replicated on the corner of 51 Barstow Avenue and 4 Garrow Hill Avenue, incidentally, both of whom have objected to this application. It's important that this open field is maintained and the area does not become overdeveloped and visually cramped. In the intervening years, nothing has changed. Indeed, the, the need for amenity green space is all the more important for emotional well-being. Shoehorning a large extension into a modest plot will clearly constitute overdevelopment now, as it did in 2008. When this application was first published with ground floor ensuite bedrooms, 
it was clearly going to become a lettered property, particularly given the applicant is a director of a residential letting company. Although the revised plans have now taken out the en-suites, the application is still a four bedroom, two bathroom and one WC property. As your report stated in fact 5.12, it had the characteristics of a HMO in an area where incidentally over 40% of all the dwellings are HMOs. With two downstairs bedrooms, it is hard to envisage this as a possible family dwelling. And whilst I cannot gainsay the applicant's assertion that it is not a HMO in the offing, understandable concerns continue amongst their neighbours. So to conclude, in a street where there are no similar extensions, this large and overbearing new building, which will, when the pitched roof is taken into account, will look like a double storey extension, and as the previous report stated, will, by virtue of its size, scale, location and design, be harmful to the character and appearance of the area, it would be an incongruous addition to the street scene and have little relationship to the surrounding area. And I urge you to refuse this application. Thank you. Uh, have the committee got any questions? Uh, Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Pavlovic. Um, obviously, as the Ward Councillor, could you talk a little bit more about sort of HMO density in the area? I know this isn't an application for a HMO. It's, it's a single storey side and rear extension with bin store to rear to give it its full title. But, um, you know, what what obviously this is a concern for, for residents. So what are the numbers like in the immediate area? So the Newland Park estate is currently running at about 47% um, as a whole HMOs. Um, most of these have been um, pre the Section 4. Um, however, there are a number of enforcement cases of properties that have been bought as family homes and that have been converted to HMOs and the owners have been instructed that they can no longer um, use them as HMOs. So um, there are ongoing enforcement cases in the area. Okay, any further questions? Councillor Webb? Thank you. Just to follow up to that, um, just quickly, I'm trying to find the bit in the papers where it says about that, that um, so it's been a while since I've been on planning. Um, the the info the information point, something we write down to say, oh yes, it'd be nice if you didn't do that. Uh, informative. Uh, informative. I knew yeah. there was a word. Informative has been put on about this very issue. A absolutely, uh, and, what, and clearly they can't. What sort of weight do you give that? Um, well, they, the the planning officers in 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 their defence um, can't make it a condition because it's already a condition. Um, in that the densities have already been exceeded and <laughs> exceeded by some distance. So all that the um, planners can do as an informative is just to reinforce the point to the owners that, these, that this property cannot be used as a HMO. And that's why my objection is not specifically around it being a potential HMO, it's about the size of the extension. And if you look at that, if you look at that, and, and I think Councillor Croshaw made the point, just on the drawings, you're talking double the size um, of, the, um, of the footprint of the original building. So it juts into that, if, if you look at the first picture of the, uh, of the photograph of, of the street area, and I don't know if, if Gareth would be able to pull that up, that, that, boom, back, 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 that, that little bit of green space that the planners in 2008 yeah. felt was so important to be maintained is going to be subject to a really quite large side extension. Okay. Thank you. I can't see any further questions. So thank Lovely. you for your time this evening. Thank you. We could move on then to um, 
the applicant, which is Emra Ozen, if you'd like to join us. Yeah, if you'd like to make a start in your three minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Emra Hozan. I'm the agent acting on behalf of my client, Nejla Aslan. The application was made on the 8th of March 2022 and validated on 28th of March 2022. After consultation period finalized, there, were, there are a few objections, mainly concerns as property will be used as HMO. Nevertheless, application is only seeking householder approval. Throughout the application process, many alterations and amendments are made to comply with the current planning policies to overcome design and visual impact issues, including neighborhood amenity. As the planning officer, Mr. Baker's report concludes, all the issues has been resolved and recommendation for approval is made. My client has no intention to use the property as HMO. She's planning to live in the property with her sister and five teenage children as a family home. It has been eight months since the application is made. My client is coping with financial and emotional, emotional overburdens as you would appreciate with the current financial situation. I hereby reiterate and confirm the property will not be used as HMO. I trust the committee will vote in favor of application and permission will be granted. Uh, if I can also add a couple of uh, comments on uh, the side extension previous on 2008. It wasn't a side extension, it was a detached two-story flats with a different access and it was covering the whole garden. So this application is completely different to that one. Uh, as as the Baker, Mr. Baker's report concludes, all the sort of uh, issues has been sort of uh, dealt with. It was initially two story. We compromised on that because of the look, the visual aspects, and uh, the fabric of the street, and looking at all the other houses. So it's in line with the other side, in line with the the, the front elevation. So it shouldn't be visually impacting on the on the area. That's that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just ask if the committee have any questions. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair. A couple of questions, if I may. Uh, thanks for coming to speak to us this evening. Um, first, you'll have heard me ask the question just about trying to understand that sort of um, living space. Uh, Gareth, I don't know if you can just go back to the um, drawings again. It, it's just around... It, I'm just trying to visualise what's being proposed. So you've got a kitchen, you've got the sort of eating area, yeah. Um, and then is that then a knocked out wall? So it's, a, it's all, open, all open. Open, yes. Um, and so that leaves then a, a living room, two bedrooms downstairs and two bedrooms upstairs. Correct. Um, and I hear the, the reassurance that you're giving about the, the fact that it's not intended to be used as an HMO, but I'm just a bit confused then. If you've got two sisters and five teenagers, so seven people in four bedrooms. Yeah. That seems a lot of people. They live to in try a and... bedroom flat at the moment. They've been renting, and they, that's what they are sort of uh, trying to yeah. expand. And two two twins, uh, one twins, they stay in the same room. Two other brothers and one sister. Okay. And two two moms stay in the main bedroom. Because you, I, I presume, as a, as an agent, you, you'll understand. Yeah, yeah. I know the, the family the, so, the, yeah. um, concerns that are, that are being raised. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's, it's, it's going to be lived. In, as a family only. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Melly. So there'll be boy, teenage boys and girls sharing a bedroom? No, oh. there's one teenage girl which will be staying with her mum in the same room. Oh, right, okay. And the other mum is going to stay in one room, the other two boys in each room. So that's what their plan is, obviously. Because currently there's a living room and there's also a kitchen slash living room. So yeah, that's that's open plan living room. Yeah, so the enclosed living room yeah. won't be turned into a bedroom. Yeah, one is like a future, quiet room, like the when the kids go, go to bed, if you like, uh, it's like a TV room. The other one is like a function open plan kitchen, dining, and sitting area. Thank you. Okay. Can't see any further questions. So I'll thank you for your time this evening. Thank you.
Okay, and then the committee got any further questions for Gareth at this point? Not to be happy to, to move into debate. And if so, is anybody willing to make a start? Councillor Crawshaw? I'll start. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, is, is my honest uh, response at the moment. It seems a huge increase on the footprint. Um, and I can completely see why people are concerned about the um, size of the increase. So setting aside anything about what might or might not happen in terms of it being an HMO, and I accept that the um, report makes clear that that would need to be dealt with separately as a separate planning application. And, and so that's, you know, that that is what that is. Um, it, it, it does seem a very, very large extension on a reasonably modest house in an area that th this wouldn't be typical. So I'm, I'm, I'm just a, a bit confused by it, I suppose, is, is where I am at the minute. Uh, Councillor Fisher and then Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a tough one. I think the size of the increase in footprint is somewhat ameliorated by the fact it's single storey as opposed to two storey. If you actually look at the overall volume of the increase, it's probably much less than, it's obviously very much less than the increase in the footprint. I take what the public speakers, Mr. Powell said, about the fact that it's not in character with the area. There are no, uh, very few other extensions in that area. I, I went around it the other day and I couldn't find any, in fact. But that doesn't preclude, in planning terms, there being extensions in an area, provided they are in keeping of the area. Similarly, that area of open space is not public open space. It's just an area that, if you look at the rest of the houses, they have quite substantial grass, uh, so, so garden sizes. So I'm not sure that is. My real concern about it, I think it's an ugly extension. I think the shape of it and the form of it is not, it's, it seems to have been designed to fit both building lines and it doesn't, to me, look a particularly attractive extension. But whether that uh, aesthetics are not really a reason for concern. The other concern obviously is the business about the HMOs, but I think we can, you know, there's clear policy in place to prevent it being used as an HMO. We've heard the applicant say, that it is going to be a family home. And I, I, I really can't see evidence to counteract that. So on balance, I think I would probably have to support approval reluctantly, but I think it's a very unattractive extension. Yeah, Webb. If this were in a village on the edge of York, we wouldn't even be discussing this. It would have been refused. Um, for the general increase in size and of the footprint, if this was uh, in green in the green belt, um, and we've been in a case where I mean I remember an application previously when I did sit on um, planning committee B when we 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 looked at an extension that was in some way blocking off um, or closing off uh, light through buildings between buildings that in the end we ended up refusing i think um because of 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 what it what it was going to do to that and uh, whereas this development is in Hall road ward it does exactly the same thing but it's in the city center and therefore it gets treated differently um and i think you know in 2008 there was a refusal um due to the loss of uh the openness of the area and the green space. And I think they're two separate things. And I take your point actually, Councillor Fisher, about the green space, because it is, is it public or private? Um, and again, it was refused in 2008 because it would lead to overdevelopment. And I, I would come down on the side that this does seem like overdevelopment when you put it up against all the other properties that you've just mentioned that haven't had any sort of extension. Um, size scale its location the design you've just mentioned it all seems a bit incongruous with the area as councillor pavlovic outlined so i'm more towards refusal at the minute um but it is a tough one Councillor Melly. thank you chair um i disagree that it isn't a large increase in volume i think it's 
got to be more than a 50% increase in volume, not just footprint, but yeah, volume of the entire property. I know we don't have an exact figure, but just looking at it. Um, in an area where there is a lot of uniformity on not just the um, row of houses that it's in, but all of the rows of houses in every direction around it. And it is in a very prominent area of the street scene but where it's very uniform and this is completely out of character. Um, and I mean, personally, I think it still has characteristics of an HMO. I think that, it, you know, there's two living rooms and one of them is enclosed and could very easily be turned into a bedroom. I think it has, still has more characteristics of an HMO than a family home that would include five teenagers and two adults with separate rooms. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to contribute to the debate for now. Oh, sorry. Um, Sure. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Thank you, Chair. Um, just take issue slightly with Councillor Webb's uh, comments about outer areas. If it was the middle of Huntington, it would get past. <laughs> if it's not in the green belt, it hasn't got the same protections. So I don't think Huntington's the middle of the city centre, but I'm not sure the whole road is either. But uh, um, I'm very sympathetic about retaining green spaces and green open views. Uh, they're important wherever we are. Um, but like Councillor Fisher, I can't see planning reasons for refusing this. Uh, if we did refuse it, we'd have to find very good reasons to refuse it, and I can't see them. Okay, Councillor Fisher. I would just reply to Councillor Webb, if I had been the mem if this had been in my ward, I wouldn't even have, uh, have called it in because we've had so many extensions of this size which have gone through without even coming to committee. They've gone straight through on the officer's recommendation. And I can quite see why Councillor Pablo is to call this in because of the lack of other extensions and the concerns about the HMOs. But please do not suggest for one second that this would have gone through on the nod. In a, in a suburban village. It would have been different in the green belt, but in, I've had dozens of applications bigger than this go through in strengths in my time. Okay. Okay, let's not get sidetracked on, on that issue. Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just wondered, Gareth, if you can give us any more information about the refused application from 2008, because I think, you know, size, scale, design, the impact on the character of the area, they're all probably the types of things that uh, those who've, who've raised concerns are, are talking about. Um, but I think the applicant suggested that it was quite a different um, application that was was refused. Um, I sort of seemed to imply that it was potentially almost a separate building that was being proposed. Uh, I'd just like to have a better understanding if I could. Uh, it was a separate building. It was a freestanding two-story um, so I just need to get the I'm afraid I've only got these on the phone. Uh, a freestanding two-story scheme uh, forward of certainly forward of the Bersto Avenue um, building line and this, it does appear to yes two flats um yeah so uh significantly different it wasn't it wasn't an extension it was a it was a freestanding small block of two flats okay i can't see any immediate indications there we go councillor crawshaw just going to raise just for people to just be thinking about then page 16 5.2 just towards the end talks about paragraph 134 of the MPPF which I think is probably the strongest grounds if people were inclined to refuse um says that development that is not well designed should be refused especially where it fails to reflect local design policies now we don't necessarily have a local design policy that covers this area but I think if you take that in context of um policy D11 and then the 2005 policy H7, both of which talk about local character. And um, that would be, I think, a fairly strong grounds to refuse if people were minded to. 
Um, so I don't think it's a case of um, you might not like the look of it, but we've got no choice. I think there is a choice um, if people are concerned that the size and the scale of the, the proposed development there is too much. Councillor Fisher. Could you, could, you, could you ask, Gareth, is there any sort of neighbourhood design statement in place? We have a village design statement in Strensel, which is a preparatory to our neighbourhood plan. It's non-statutory, but it, it clearly gives guidance as to what we expect. Is anything similar in place in this area? Uh, no, but we, what we do have is the um, the uh, SPD, the House Extensions and Alterations SPD, which is uh, summarised insofar as it re relates to side extensions on page 16 and 17, uh, paragraph 5.5. Um, so just pulling some of those out, it suggests that uh, if not sensitively designed or located, side extensions can erode the open space within the street and create an environment that's incoherent and jumbled. Um, section 12.4 states unduly wide extension should normally be avoided unless they have been designed to successfully harmonise with the architectural features of the original property. Uh, and then 13.2 um, talks about impacts on sunlight, uh, windows and uh, uh, on adjacent properties. And then the report obviously considers uh, the proposals against those um, um, against those guidelines. So the uh, you know the, the, the building has been it's been designed. Uh, it's been taken back from its original original height. Um, it it meets uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't run through the the building line, for example, uh, matching materials. And uh, and keeps that uh, that hip design to the roof. Okay. Can't then see any further indications. If we're obviously in our new process, we're required to consider the uh, officer recommendation first. So, Councillor Fisher, I know earlier you mentioned that you might be minded to support it. You. I'm not sufficient enough to move it. Okay. So is anybody willing to move it? If not, I will. Okay. Okay, so I'll move that. Is anybody willing to second it? Councillor Oral? Okay. Is there any further debate then before we vote? Can't see any. Gareth, could you just give us a quick summary then, and then we'll, we'll take the votes. Um, so the uh, recommendation is that the recommendation is that permission be granted, um, subject to the conditions set out on page nineteen of the report. Okay, can I see all those in favour? Okay, all those against. Okay, so I make that four, four, and three against. That has been approved. Okay, okay, thank you. Just give um, members of the public a minute. So I think I think it's out this way. There's a risk of getting trapped if you head the other way. Okay, okay Gareth, if we move on to four B. Thank you, Chair. This is uh Planning application at 19 Hillcrest Avenue in Nether Poppleton. Uh, it's a proposal for demolition of the existing bungalow on the site and the construction of a new bungalow, which is uh, built to passive house standards. I just run through the uh, the presentation. Um, so there's a, a photo of the front of the dwelling, uh, street scene. Uh, there's the 
application uh, property in the, the line of that row of three bungalows. Property there, center shot. Um, there is a, a public right of way that runs behind. And uh, just of note there, I think the, 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 the variation of um, bungalows, two-story houses, there is a commonality of design runs through the, the most of, uh, of Hillcrest. Existing site plan showing the, the L shape um, of the existing property and its existing floor plan and elevations. The proposed site plan and the proposed floor plans. So on there, the, the, the gray is the, is the footprint of the existing dwelling. So showing the, the maintenance of the, the, the existing space at the side. And then the proposed elevations. So uh, I think a, a, a 650 or so millimeter uh, increase in the ridge height compared to what's existing. Okay, and there's no there's no updates. There's no other updates to the report. Yeah, committee uh, members got any initial questions for Gareth, um, Council Porsche, and then Councillor Miller. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Just two quick ones, hopefully. Um, so it's got a slightly higher ridge height, six forty millimeters. Um, I was trying to judge. It looks from the drawing. That you've got up there as though the ridge is also just moved slightly back is that would that be correct so that it's where the, where the ridge is in relation to the road is just slightly set back than the existing um, yes it would be because the uh the roof the expanse of the roof is greater uh so yes if you can judge it you yeah. hold that picture and then we move to the to that one yeah so the the line is common with with number 21 at the moment yeah um and then the other question um which may be um better with the with the planning officer i'm not sure it's, it's just in paragraph 5.11 um so it talks about um using reclaimed bricks and reclaimed roof tiles so the, the the roof finish would be the same as the finish that we can see in the photograph, presumably. And with the bricks, was it to reclaim the bricks of the building that's to be demolished to use on the front of the building as well? So, as far as possible, um, the applicant will use the existing bricks. Um, if not, he will source them from from elsewhere which will be matching to the existing property. And it'd be the same with the roof tiles as well. So in effect, from the front, there might be changes to the windows and door mm -hmm. positions and things, but the, the, broadly speaking, the, the roof visually looks pretty much the same as it currently does, and the wall would yes. essentially look the same as, as the next door's yes. properties. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Nelly. Um, Thank you, Chair. So one of the things about passive houses is that, they, is that they usually have some sort of energy generation or extraction on site, such as a some sort of heat pump. Is that in the plant at the back of the building? Plant room. There is a plant room. Um, sorry, there, there is a plant room, uh, which is just in that corner behind the garage. Yeah. Is that expected to cause any noise or anything? Is that expected to cause any noise or anything for the neighbour at number twenty-one? Yeah, uh, it's not been raised an issue from our public protection team. No, nothing was raised. Councillor Oral, thank you, Chair. Um, it's good that uh, some developers are now following the council in doing passive house. Uh, it would be great if all house builders did the same. Um, we can't obviously condition the passive house. No, no. 
Um, we Look, can't really condition beyond what our policy asks for. Right, but I can't see conditions for sustainability there. All right. <laughs> yes, um, I assume it's because it's the, it's kind of embodied in what they're applying for. Mm -hmm. But um, I take your point as a backstop. Um, we can have a condition that references the, the, the policy or more accurately the policy and the current building regulations because the, the current building, the 2021 edition of the building regulations mm -hmm. um, pretty much meet our policy requirements at the moment. And but can yes. we condition the use of the, the tiles and the bricks? Yes, well that's on the that's on the approved uh, that's on the approved drawings. I would actually uh, there's, there's something I, I need to um, add. So um, uh, Councillor Hook uh, raised the issue of um, uh, solar panels, um, solar PV panels, and they there are no solar PV panels shown on the uh, on the roof of the building. Um, it is the intention of the applicant to install them, but after the building is constructed, uh, there is a reason for that, and the applicant may be able to describe better what that reason is. So they would intend to rely on permitted development rights mm -hmm. to, to re I guess it's kind of retrofit uh, the solar panels. Um, we did have a... A, draw, uh, a photo which showed an example of what they're what they're proposing. So I think it's a, a case of ignore the ignore the background tiles. But this is a um, a micro mm -hmm. yeah. tile fitted to each individual tile rather than a block, which is the intention. But um, and that could be done on the permitted development. It could because this is outside of a conservation area. So. Um, okay. And policies, including policy of the neighbourhood plan, encourage um, encourage photovoltaics. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Melling. Would that change the brown red nature of the tiles, having that kind of proportion taken up with a solar panel? And is that a factor? I I um, I don't know. Um, we have the. Because it's not proposed as part of the planning application, there, there's there's no detail, um, and this as an issue came up quite rather late in the day. Uh, but their intention is to 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 retrofit these individual micro tiles. Okay, I can't see any further questions. If we're able then to move on to the public speakers. Um, our first speaker is Colin Wood, um, who isn't able to join us this evening, but he sent a written statement, which I've agreed to read out on his behalf. But I will time myself. So this is the written submission of Colin Wood. Um, the planning officer has already made her recommendations, which seem to say it does not matter how many people object, the plan is approved. What price local democracy then? How many people need to object and in what specific way should they do it to get the council to listen? The number of objectors yardstick is flawed due to the process for handling them not being transparent. The decision to go ahead is just wrong. If any of you had this proposal put to you for your own road, you would object to it. I helped write the village design statement many years ago because I was proud of my village and its development. I continue to maintain this demolition rebuild goes against it. No objector attended the second parish council meeting. Many did not know about it. And it was chaired by not the usual experienced planning committee chairman, but somebody who does not even live in Poppleton. City built council are going to keep one of their own buildings and retrofit it to a very high thermal comfort standards, um, according to our city. So we can legitimately think that there is one rule for a council scheme. It clearly can be effectively done and a different rule for our residential road. Improvement is one thing. Demolition of a sound building and rebuild is quite another. We have lived here for 30 years and my wife, who has a, a life-limiting lung condition, could do without all this upheaval. Thank you, Colin Wood. Okay, obviously, Mr Wood isn't here for 
questions. So we'll move on then to uh, David Partington, if you'd like to join us. Um, yep, yeah, I'm sure you've seen, you've, you'll have three minutes to address the committee and I'll give you a warning about 30 seconds to go. Thank you. In this throwaway world where so many things end up in landfill, trying to be environmentally friendly is a good thing. Indeed, a low carbon sustainable design, if true, is a laudable aspiration. And there are so many locations where this application could fit perfectly. Millfield Lane just around the corner is a prime example with 80 plus dwellings, almost all of which are completely individual, built by different people at different times with different heights, different styles, some brick, others with rendering. Compare, compare that, however, to the development in Hillcrest Avenue where I've lived for more than 23 years. We and many others chose this location because we like the consistent style of property by the same architect and the same builder. The houses have a consistent roof height. The bungalows have a consistent roof height. They all have a consistent pitch to the roof and a consistent style of roof tiles. All the properties were built with a consistent Georgian style shallow bay window. The important word here is consistent. This application is anything but consistent with the design matching exactly none of those consistent attributes present in other properties. To some, the house will be considered cutting edge, but Hillcrest Avenue or this section of it is not the right place to cut that edge especially when it requires a perfectly serviceable house to be demolished with no net gain in the housing stock and no doubt the high proportion ending up in landfill. I hope the council do not just rubber stamp this based on aspirational environmental claims to meet some targets that they've been given. Now I counted 29 properties in this newer section of the avenue and at the time of the original application of those 29, two were vacant, one had residents abroad, and two others said they were completely unaware of the application because the council no longer posts the notices on the lampposts. That leaves 24 properties with an opportunity to object. Let me say that again, 24. As I understand it, there were 23 written objections to the original application, most of whom were unaware that the council could or would simply discount their objections if even a slightly modified application was submitted. Exactly how many how many objections would it take for the council to agree that demolishing a consistent property and imposing an inconsistent property in Hillcrest Avenue was wrong? How many? Many of the objections specifically mentioned the front elevation design and the roof height and the materials being out of place. 30 seconds left. Um, while a revised application replaced silicon rendering bricks and to the front and original roof tiles, the overall inconsistent style of the building remains. I'm also concerned that while the revised application seen by the Nether Poppleton Council states, and I quote, a pitched roof to be finished in concrete roof tiles, either reclaimed from its existing dwelling or new concrete tiles to match, a document filed just a few days ago with York Council raises the question if that's still the case. At this late stage, that would simply not be fair to local residents and could easily give the impression that the applicant is gaming the system, presenting one change to get around local objections at the parish council and then a different one to York to impress you with environmental credentials. In conclusion, consistent design details may not be immediately obvious to those unfamiliar with the avenue or during a cursory site visit and therefore may be easily dismissed, deliberately ignored or not mentioned in official reports. Nevertheless, I can tell you there is nothing about this application that fits in with the consistent uniform design that is the very essence of Hillcrest Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just ask if the committee have any questions. Um, I can't see any, so I'll, I'll thank you for your time this thank evening. You. Thank you. Next, then, if we could have um, Gareth Ede. Um, and similarly, I, you've got three minutes to address the committee, and I'll, I'll give you a warning about 30 seconds, but if okay. you'd like to make a start. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, so I'm the applicant in respect of 19 Hillcrest. It's a tired 1970s bungalow in need of extensive renovation. It doesn't meet current building regulations and has a poor energy performance rating of D. Even with renovation, it's unlikely to achieve an energy rating better than a C. This is because the core structure is not sufficiently airtight and it's riddled with cold bridges. These are areas of the structure that lack thermal breaks and therefore allow heat to transfer out. 
I want to create a passive house standard structure that's so airtight and so well insulated that no central heating system is required, no heat pumps, nothing. It will be constructed from insulated concrete formwork, a method which is proven to achieve the highest standards of air tightness and insulation and eliminate cold bridges entirely. It will not just smash current building regulations, but significantly exceed the future homes standard that comes into force in 2025. My proposed bungalow will be net zero carbon to run reducing its current carbon footprint from six tonnes of CO2 a year to zero. It will therefore contribute to the York City Council's published ambition for the city to be net zero carbon by 2030. The National Planning Policy Framework contains a presumption in favour of sustainable development proposals like mine. Likewise, the Poppleton Neighbourhood Plan states that new developments that exceed building regulations and use renewable technology will be particularly supported. Turning to the street scene, Hillcrest Avenue is a mix of bungalows and houses of varying appearances. If you were to look at the most prominent row of seven bungalows from numbers 45A to 57, every single one has a different appearance, differing roof heights, pitches and colors, and different shapes and sizes of windows. The only consistent characteristics are brick facades and tiled roofs. My proposed design has a hipped roof which is tiled and a brick facade and will therefore fit in with the street scene. Indeed, the parish council raised no objections to the current version of the plans. 30 seconds left. To sum up, bungalows of the exceptional passive house standard that I desire simply don't exist to buy in Poppleton or the surrounding areas. I want to create a bungalow fit for the future, which is zero carbon to run, which will be my forever home. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll just ask if the committee have any questions. Mr. Dolby. Just uh, some questions, I think, um, around the, the use of or non use of PV tiles. Could you explain that to us? Yeah, so I, I obviously want to be able to generate my own clean electricity as part of the whole you know I, I want to be doing good things for the environment and so it'd be silly not to put solar pv onto it um i don't want to be relying on the grid and what's happened recently with the energy crisis i mean that's happened unfolded since i put in the original designs um and you know that's just strengthened my resolve to be as as uh, less reliant on the grid as possible and with battery storage as well we plan to put battery storage in the garage or plant room and basically we'll be able to store the excess electricity generated from the panels during the day and use them during the evening so again reducing the the call to get power from the grid thank you okay i don't see any further questions so thank you for your time this evening thank you thank you Last any questions to you, to Gareth again, or so Councillor Webb and then Councillor Fisher. Thank you, uh, Gareth. Can you bring up the picture of the the street again? Because obviously this word consistency has been used a lot, and there was definitely a, a picture that showed several different properties. That wasn't it. <laughs> that one there, and and could you just put your cursor over the one we're talking about? It's the one in the middle there, isn't it? Yes, good. Okay, because. Would you say that every property there is consistent, looks the same in that picture? Sorry, is that a question to me? Yeah, so, you know, but that's been the argument. I suppose well, a, they don't look it to me. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a general um, sort of design ethos, I guess, that runs through. Um, the, the 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 tiles uh, sorry the tiles the bricks are generally buff yellow uh, but they're not the same there there is a variety of of type and shade um, the roofs have 
pretty much the same profile of, of tile. They're, uh, they look like a concrete pan tile, um, but they are, uh, these ones, for example, are gray. Um, and I think where they've been replaced, they're slightly brighter. Um, uh, I think one on this side is, uh, has also been replaced. So they're slightly different. Um, and then some are bungalows and some are two bed dwellings, but there is a, there's a, there is a coherence to them, but they're not, they're not uniform. Councillor Fisher. Thank you, Chair. Uh, a number of the objectors have complained about the demolition of the building and how environmentally friendly it is, but we deal with planning policy. Uh, is there any planning policy in place that would stop the applicant just demolishing this bungalow without applying for planning permission? Um, they couldn't do it without, they couldn't do it without permission. Um, uh, but the uh, the the um, the prior approval requirements are quite limited in terms of uh, what we can look at if someone just applies for a demolition of a building without a rebuild. Um, in terms of the 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 issue of the loss of the uh, what on the face of it appears to be a, a sound building, um, there are no policies in the MPPF, and there are no policies in our local planning document which suggests that we can resist um, demolition and rebuild on those grounds alone. Thank you. That's what I thought. Okay, Councillor Melly. <clears throat> Um, how much weight do we give to this, um, not uniformity, but kind of consistency of character and appearance of the street scene and the kind of red and yellow bricks and brown red tile? Well, it's a, it's a material consideration in the, um, on the basis of um, whether you consider what's proposed is harmful to the street scene because of its design differences. And the so the, the the neighborhood plan, which is the development plan, and our decision should be made in accordance with that unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Um, and I'm not going to be able to find the relevant policy now. Policy. Yeah, PNP. So this PNP um, 6A, on, um, which is repeated in 5.8, so page 34, talks about the construction of a single dwelling within the curtilage of a domestic property, supported where the proposals are in character with the surrounding development, designed to safeguard the amenities of existing residential properties. Um, designed to provide appropriate elements of garden and amenity space and um, appropriate levels of vehicle parking and access. And then PMP4 talks about um, developments supported where they bring forward high quality design appropriate with their character and appearance uh, and then refers to the policies of the um, of the Poppleton Design Guide, which again has policies about uh, materials to be used and the, the characteristics of surrounding developments. So it's the, the, the policy basis is about, as it is in most of the city where we have policies, is about things that are appropriate to their appropriate to their setting. And our recommendation here is this is not inappropriate. Okay. There's no further questions then. If we're happy to move into the basins, I'll look for somebody to make a start. Councillor Webb, then Councillor Fisher, then Councillor Crawshaw. Thank you, Chair. Um, I tend to agree that I don't think that this is an inappropriate development. Um, I think it's worth, definitely worth considering whether there is uniformity in, in the houses on the street, but I think the picture that's up there sort of suggests that it's not as uniform as, well, certainly not as uniform as the last application we looked at. Um, 
So on those grounds, I'd like to propo propose approval as per the officer recommendation. Okay, thank you. Just hang on to that for a minute so I'll still go to Councillor Fisher. Thanks, Chair. What I've got to remember is that planning is not a popularity contest. Even when there are lots of objections, as there are in this case, they must be on valid planning grounds. And I've looked through the reasons that the neighbours have put for objection. And the vast majority of them are not based on planning matters like the value of houses or will set a repressant for demolition, similar redevelopment. That's not planning matter. Some of them are clearly wrong. Things like, for example, it will cause massive inconvenience, loss of light. It won't. It's only a two foot effectively increase in the ridge height, which is not, not significant in any way. Um, and others are just wrong. And I'm sorry, but I cannot see a single valid reason for refusing this application. If we're talking about conformity in the street scene, there was an application in Strensel, number 60 Barley Rise, which is in my ward, where there were five identical bungalows. And one of the owners decided to put in an application to turn it into a two story house with a colossal side and rear extension. It was refused by this council and it was approved by a planning committee, by a planning inspector. Uh, who said that they did not break the conformity of the street scene. This certainly, this is far less conformed. I mean, there's, it's, it's, every house is virtually different. So I'm sorry, I just cannot hold any other view, but we must approve this. And if you propose it, I will happily second it. Okay, Councillor Croshaw. Thanks, Chair. Um, I was going to make some of the same points that Councillor Fisher's just made, um, but I think what I'll just add um, is, is actually this is more than a not inappropriate. Um, I, I can't see how this doesn't fit with exactly what the neighbourhood plan in this area is asking for, particularly PMP 11 at paragraph 5.6, um, talking about new developments that exceed building regulations regarding energy conservation and renewable energy should particularly be supported. I think change is always um, unnerving for people um, I understand that and any development of any sort will always have some amount of disruption I, I absolutely understand that as well but actually it seems to me that the design of this building has been um, done in such a way as to to do as much as possible to fit in with the um, local area in particular reusing the bricks and reusing the um, roof tiles um, and I think the only kind of query that I had about the application when I read through the um, report was just that sort of thought of thinking do we have to knock a building down in order to build something new is there a better way of reusing the building but actually I think that that was addressed by the applicant in terms of some buildings you can retrofit and, and upgrade other buildings actually on balance you're better off um, going so I, I, th I think we should have no hesitation in supporting this and I think I would hope that the community will see in time that it is a sympathetic design that fits in well. And if this is somebody who wants to be in the area for, you know, their forever home, I think they said, then, you know, I wish them all the best in, in settling in that community and, and hope that it doesn't form any long-term um, contention. Okay, so we've had it uh, proposed and seconded. Um, obviously we had the, the slight addition of a, a condition on the sustainability suggested earlier by Councillor Oral, um, is that the inclusion, Gareth, of a standard condition? Um, Standard-ish condition. Um, there has the, it. It always has some variations, but basically, it's it seeks um, compliance with um, policy CC one or CC two. I, I forget which. Um, or the fallback of the 2021 building regulations. Okay. I'll assume we're happy with the inclusion of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that aspect delegated to officers to. Yes. Okay. Okay. So if there's no further debate, then I can't see any. So you able to just give us a quick yeah. summary? So um, it's recommended that permission be granted, subject to the. Uh, conditions in report and the additional condition uh, regarding um, carbon reduction. Okay, can I see all those in favour? Okay, it's unanimous, so that's approved. I'll just give members of the public a 
couple of minutes to to find your way out and if you could please come to the to the front um I assume members are happy to to carry straight on. If not, if yeah, okay. Gareth, if we can move to four C. Thank you, Chair. So this is planning application for uh, your college on uh, Simbolt Lane. Uh, the proposal is for a two-story extension to the uh, construction education center and it provides workshop space and an additional classroom space i'll just go through the presentation so uh this is the the main um vehicle access uh private car access i should say uh to the college um from Simbolt lane and uh here is this is the uh, this is the construction skills center uh, which was built later uh, than the the main college building, which I think was constructed around about 2007. And this was a later addition. Um, continuing my, my, my love of Google Earth. Uh, so this is the construction centre, uh, the decked car park behind it, Simbolt Lane, and then the um, uh, artificial pitch and then the other pitches go on uh, beyond there and here is a this is at the moment there's 25 uh, car parking spaces in this area and this is the location where the extension is proposed you see the um and this shows the uh the marquees which are on that location they're referred to in the report and they provide overspill space for the the, the practical um skills um, and it's more of a contextual uh, image here with the main college behind and the city uh, to the north. Existing site plan. So there's those car parking spaces and the, the marquees set out there. The elevations don't actually come out particularly well. Um, but the uh, this is the south elevation, so that elevation facing Simbolt Lane. And the proposed site plan, so here's the, the outline uh, leaving the access into the car park intact. Joinery workshop and um, bricklaying workshop at ground floor level. And then the first floor plan um, this is within the existing building, which the IT suites, classrooms, and uh, two uh, two laboratories there. Proposed elevations. Um, problem with a mat <laughs> uh, the design that matches what's behind it. It's actually quite difficult to pick out um, what's uh, where the extension is. But this this element here in that south elevation is the proposal. And um, these three D views actually illustrate it quite nicely. So the PVs on the roof, and then slightly more contextual. So with the access up to the uh, up to the decked car park. That's it. Uh, there is uh, an update. Um, there was a. Paragraph 516 was uh, was left hanging. Um, we've had some additional information. Um, so uh, as, as submitted, the, the, the details said that the, the building at the moment is operating well above its current capacity. And that's one of the reasons, in addition to social distancing, that they put the mark keys in. Um, so this, uh, this proposal would not increase staff or student numbers um and then as the city of your council parking guidance for education facilities is based on staff and student numbers 
uh, we don't feel that it's reasonable or in line with the SIL regulations to require the parking surveys and uh, possible parking restrictions in the square uh, as planning obligations. And we've, we've spoken to the, uh, the highways officers and with that additional information, they agree. Okay. If there's any questions then for Gareth, obviously there's no public speakers for this item, so this is the, the one chance. So, Councillor Crawshaw? Uh, just a quick point of clarity. Um, I think that I know what this is on. on it's page 78 of our report. In fact, it's, it's the screen you've got up. So, um, where there's that sort of the triangular building, um, it looks as though there are an array of PVs. Is that what that, the white stripes are? And then are they roof lights that are the um, sort of rectangle, bluish colour rectangles that we can see? Uh, yes, yeah, that's correct. Thank you. Okay. Anything? And that, oh, sorry, I was just going to illustrate that. I think because with the extension, these these um, IT suites become sort of landlocked, I guess. So then natural light comes through the, through the roof. Okay. Any further questions? If not, are we happy to move to debate? And if so, Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, I think that actually the way this has been designed to fit in that particular part of the site is is very clever. Uh, there's clearly a need. I think actually it's really interesting to see that, that this is that they're looking at a construction facility and, and that this is something that's clear demand for. And um, I'd be happy to approve uh, based on officer recommendations. Okay, Councillor Crawshaw. Yeah, happy to second that. Okay. Any further debate? No. So, Gareth, if you could give us a summary of where we are. So, uh, uh, recommended that motion be granted, subject to the conditions outlined in uh, page 60 of the report and on this. Okay, could I see all those in favour? Okay. Yeah, that's unanimous again. So that's approved. So this is an application at uh, 56 Westminster Road uh, for um, single storey side and rear extensions, a dormer to the rear, a uh, raised terrace um, at the rear following the demolition of the existing conservatory. So the property is a centre shot here, semi-detached property at number 56. This is the uh, the space between the adjoining dwellings and the garage to be demolished at the rear. Uh, close up of the garage, uh, you can see the um, St. Peter's School playing fields uh, to the back. And then uh, the neighboring property at number 58 has a terrace, which is uh, just there where the, the cursor is. The um, Google Earth view. So this is the property here. You see the neighbouring property extended to the rear with the dormer. Um, the small terraces there at the moment. The uh, uh, the layout of the neighbours. Uh, the extension. Uh, sorry, the, the garage to be demolished there. Scheme drawings, existing site plan. I think show the. The, the, the neighbouring properties extending beyond uh, the, the, the subject property. Existing ground floor plans. 
and the existing elevations. Proposed site plan, so the, the extensions projecting as far as, uh, almost as far as number 54's attached property, and then to the shared boundary with number 58 and the, the side extension set back from that front elevation there. And this is the extent of the, the terrace proposed. Proposed ground floor plan. And the elevations, so side from the front, so you have that side extension, the lean-to roof, it wraps around to the rear, projecting about 3.5 metres to the rear. And then this terrace on the plinth left by the demolition of the garage with a 1.4 metre high brick wall, um, which wraps marginally around the back. Uh, as uh, uh, to, to give some privacy between the two properties. So, okay, are there any questions for Gareth? What Councillor Fisher, then Councillor Crawshaw? Thank you, Chair. Um, Gareth, <clears throat> the terrace um, is raised and there's a 1.4 metre brick wall. Does that mean that it would be possible for people standing over that terrace to look over directly over into the neighbour's back garden? It'd be possible for me to look over it, yes, and people, yeah, uh, it's not uh, it's not intended to um, to entirely screen uh, the two properties from each other. It's uh, you know that the intention I think is to when people are on the terrace and, and sitting um, uh, for 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 it to be um, for it to be to screen that, but. If somebody walked up to that wall and you know would tell by the 1.4 meters in height, then they would be able to look over it if that's what they wish to do. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Crosswell. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of understand the, the terrace a little bit better as well. Um, and I've just been sort of looking at the it's, it's helpful actually seeing them in colour versus the, the black and white. So am I correct that the that top right elevation that we've got there and in fact the one below it as well so the the gray line that's the continuation of the ground level is the ground level of the existing garage yeah. that'd be correct and so essentially currently what's there is a higher wall than a 1.4 meter wall which makes up the dividing wall of the garage is that have i understood the yeah. site correctly um, i'll go back to the photographs it's probably the best illustration well, that's quite a good illustration. So at the moment there is a so this is the this is the garage which acts as a you know acts a, does act as a barrier between the two properties. Uh, there's um uh, there's a fence and a gate here at the moment uh, which leads from the driveway into uh, the existing terrace at the back and then the garden slopes down. Uh, to the lower level of garden, um, yeah. So, so effectively, from that shot there, what what will be there will be rather than the garage door, you'll be looking onto the terrace with a wall that's one point four meters high. Yeah, where you're where you're yeah, right about there. Yeah. And as we currently are at the minute, you can look out of the garage over the. Two gardens, I guess, because that's, that's the other bit where there might be some overlooking. There, there looks to be a window in the rear of the garage. We were there yesterday. Oh, yes, so there is. Yes. Yeah. So, if, if I may, just the, the one other question obviously, with planning applications, we're always looking at the application that's before us, not what it might be. But um, do you know if there's any, um, how that height of 1.4 meters was arrived at? as opposed to what's probably, I guess, a 1.8 or two meter high wall or whatever it is currently? Uh, it was um, it was what was submitted by the applicant to address the issue that was raised with them of, of privacy on the boundary. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? No. So we've got one public speaker on this item, um, Margaret Richardson. Thank you. Thank you for, for your patience as well this evening. But 
like to join us. Um, yeah, and you'll have heard you've got three minutes to address the committee and I'll give you a warning about 30 seconds to go. But if you'd like to, to make a start in your own time. OK, thank you very much. Yes, I'm Margaret Richardson, joint owner of the neighbouring property number 58. Can I thank the uh, members for the opportunity to speak? We've considered the appraisal by the planning department regarding our objections to the proposed development at number 56 Westminster Road and would like to explain in more detail the reasons why we object by providing further information and photographs of the impact that this extension will make to our house and the street scene. Um, I believe you've all got some photographs there. Based on paragraphs 5.5 and 5.9 about amenity of current neighbours and street scene, we would be grateful if you would consider the photographs of the street scene on page one. We've examined the whole of Westminster Road and as stated, it mainly comprises semi-detached houses, each with a garage. This means that the space between most houses consists of two driveways. There are a few detached houses and we have looked at them all. If you look on page two, ours is a detached house and houses like ours all have at least only one full driveway between the houses. But if this driveway is built over, Ours will be the exception. Number 58 only has a pathway just wide enough to get a lawnmower down and is only 56 inches or 143 centimetres from the boundary edge. And the proposed extension will therefore turn our garden path into a passage. It will create a precedent to the street scene in that it will be the only house on the street with an extension this close to its neighbour. If you look at picture two, you'll see the proximity of the two houses. And when that fence is removed and replaced by a brick wall, it's going to be very claustrophobic. Um, there was another comment, uh, 5.20, states that there is an inset door to the ground floor side which does not appear to serve a habitable room. This is wrong. 30 seconds left, thank you. It goes directly into the kitchen where we ate most of our meals right back to 1954. If the extension goes ahead, we will walk out directly and be faced with a long black wall of the utility room. The proposed wall on the terrace will not stop people looking down and it will make usage of 58 terrace very uncomfortable. The new terrace is going to be just 115 centimetres or 45 inches away from the existing terrace. I do hope the photographs illustrate this. Okay. The view will be straight onto our terrace, into our kitchen, and into the dining room, come snug. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll just ask if the committee have any questions. Uh, Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for coming to speak to us this evening. Um, I'm just wanting to sort of understand in terms of, because I, I think... You've perhaps raised something there that I hadn't been thinking about when I was reading through the report. So there's the issue of the terrace and how that would impact. Um, but actually, it's the it's the proximity to your um, house along the side bit that, that's the bit that's just making me sort of think about now. Um, so from what you're saying, what I'm understanding is that you have a... Presumably you don't have any sort of side windows as such between the two buildings, but you've got a door that's your entrance into your kitchen. And yeah. So, and that's a glazed door, is it? That you, no, you see um, it's sort of inset and 
There was a coal house on one side and the door to the kitchen on the other. Prior to this application being made, we decided to put an external door on there flush with the outside just to stop drafts going straight through into the kitchen. Um, and if we did that, the door would have to open outwards and we'd be just 26 inches away from this new wall, which is a boot room. Um, I mean, it is a very narrow passage. We can just get a lawnmower along. So, so is it is it your your concern? I mean, I'm just trying to sort of understand the the impact that it, your your concern that it would have on you because it we we would maybe talk about it in terms of your remunity. Yes, um, but is it is the concern about sort of principally about um, it creating a sort of a narrow passageway? Is that, yeah, is that the, it's the, an kind of the main, yes, it, the main it could be concern? a passageway like an like yeah. an alley. Yeah. And there's nothing like that anywhere else in the street. Um, yeah. That's the picture I did, uh, page two, the second one, the second picture. You can see the fence going between two properties. Well, next door is going to come right up to where that fence is going to be. Be to <laughs> touch it. <laughs> And if I may, um, just just one other bit then just about, so, so there's, there's that aspect of it. The, the other aspect of it around the, the terrace itself, um, mm -hmm. and I guess these sorts of things are quite tricky, aren't they? Because, I, I, you know, I live in South Bank, and, and in South Bank, a lot of the back gardens actually have, you know, walls between them that are yes, waist yeah. height, you know. Yes. Um, I understand that, you know, if you've got a wall that somebody is standing right next to and it's you know sort of up to here so you can look over but just in terms of how you use your garden how how your neighbors on the other side use your garden um the report suggests that this will be most likely be used for seating um do you, would you accept that that you know in terms of a, you know this this as a terrace is not being built as a platform to look into your garden as such so there might be some amount of overlooking but it's a the way in which the neighbours might use the space. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think of... Well, next door has a higher elevation than ourselves anyway. So, you know, when you're talking single storey, it's yeah. actually more than that. And, you know, we can't sort of say, well, you can only sit down on it. Mm. Um, you know, it's a, a big terrace. Mm. You know, you can have barbecues, music, all sorts mm. there. Ours is just a small one, it takes two or three chairs mm. um but it's also the proximity of it i mean where did i put it what oh yes 45 inches their terrace is 45 inches from our terrace which is about that much <laughs> mm. okay okay it's, yeah thank you thank you that's helpful thank you any further questions I can't see any, so I'll thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Do members then have any further questions for, for Gareth? That's sufficient. Could you clarify, please, Gareth? Is a kitchen defined as a a habitable room, irrespective of whether it's used for dining. Uh, irrespective if it's used for dining. Right, I was going to have to praise you that with, it's one of my could be answers, but uh, <laughs> if it's just a, we, we tend to, um, we tend to, we tend to class it as a habitable room if it's, if it's a dining kitchen. Um, but we, you know, it does, I think because of the time people spend, even if it's not a dining kitchen, it, it deserves some weight in the, um, in, in amenity terms, over and above, say, a bathroom or something like that. Thank you for that. Any further questions? I can't see any, so if we're happy then to move to debate, and if anybody's willing to have the first stab, thanks to Joshua. I'll, I'll just give you a sense of where I'm thinking at the moment. Um, because I do, I, I can I can see um, 
bits of this that I, I have sympathy with and bits of it that I, that I have less so. So that, that picture is quite good in terms of the, the, the aspects around the terrace. I can understand how um, you might feel concerned that there's going to be a raised area that's sort of a, you know, I think I've used the term viewing platform before in previous applications, but actually you've got that all the way along the street. And I, and I think that in some respects that is part of when you live in a reasonably densely packed area, um, there is always an element of looking into your neighbor's garden and, and certainly my neighbors can see into my garden and I can see into their garden to, to a certain degree. Um, and I think that a 1.4 meter high wall, if it proved to be intrusive, there's things you could do like trellises and planting and various things like that, which I think could ameliorate that part of the problem. So I, I, I'm, I can understand why it will be a concern, but I also think it, it sort of is what it is. The bit that I've kind of got more of an issue with actually, and I, I hadn't really appreciated it until hearing the public speaker is the, the extent to which it creates quite a narrow alleyway along between the two properties and that pushing out of the side of the building to create that extra space there. I'm just a bit concerned about what that then does to the feel and sense of not necessarily the street as a whole, but just in particular that neighboring property and you know, I can see completely how opening a door onto a big sort of, you know, brick wall right right in front of your kitchen door is, is not going to be very nice. So I'd, I think there probably is more impact on the amenity of the neighbours than I perhaps had appreciated. Whether or not that would be enough grounds to put together for a refusal, I think I'll, I'll hear what other people think about it. Um, I'm, I'm not persuaded either way, but I do have I do have a concern about that aspect of this. That's sufficient. Um, I think if we were to refuse this on the grounds of the reducing the separation between the properties, and we did it on the grounds that it reduced the immediacy of the neighbour, I think we'll be on very dodgy ground. It's been done on far, far, far too many other sites. Whether or not we could hold that up that its own characteristic of the street scene, I still don't think it would hold water. Um, I mean, I can say personal, personal experience, my property was built right next to another house and the gap between them is less than three feet, but it's adequate. So, you know, there is, there is that. what does worry me is the increase in loss of money to the back garden. Now, at the moment, there's a garage there. No one's going to stand on the roof of the garage and look into the back garden. The 1.4 metre fence is only, in old language, four foot seven. Unless you're Warwick Davis, you'll be able to look over the top of it without any problems whatsoever. You know, um, anyone of, of standard stature will be able to look into the garden. And I think that is somewhat concerning, actually. I have a, a, relative, a resident in my area who's had the same thing happen to him. Somebody's constructed a roof terrace next to him without planning permission and now spends quite a lot of time leering over into the garden while the family are out in the back garden. And, you know, I, I'd be worried if I lost that kind of uh, privacy, to be honest. Um, there is overlooking, but it's from a distance. So that's my concern. I don't know if 1.4 metres is, is adequate because it doesn't prevent a person of average height being able to look into the back garden from close range. Thank you. Um, the question I was just asking after was about the whether an extension to the size could be permitted development. Um, it might just be worth. Can I just ask the test? Yeah, so um, the if it was. If there was a side extension which wasn't connected to the rear extension, then that would likely be permitted development. So 2.5 meters eave side, and the permitted development rights allow higher than that. It's the it's the 
the wraparound nature and the fact that the rear extension is more than three meters that creates the requirement for the uh, for the planning permission leaving aside the, the raised terrace, which would always require permission. Uh, Councillor Webb. Thank you. Um, following on from the, the, the chat about the fact that the neighbours are going to be opening the door onto a, to a wall, it, in terms of amenity lost or not, um, it won't actually change the nature of the use of that alley it might change the look of it and i accept that it will definitely change the look of it but in terms of what the alley is used for it's not actually making it any difference in width than it's you know i imagine it's it's used for as the the the, the uh, public speaker said moving a lawnmower up and down and, and that sort of thing so in terms of amenity gareth um is that the width of that alley that it's not changed the width it's just changed the fact that there's a brick wall on side and not a small fence is that a sort of a change in amenity so to speak the issue is probably one of outlook um and uh i because it's not a it's not the primary entrance it's not the the entrance to the front door along that side um i i would say that the the, the likelihood of a if we were to refuse plan permission to refuse because of the impact on that on that side access and narrowing narrowing it and the outlook the loss of outlook and the loss of, loss of spaciousness um i say it's very weak I can't imagine how we would defend it successfully. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I've come back on is I've, I've probably knocked on a fair few more doors than yourself, Gareth, and a lot of people do have the main entrance on the side of the, the property into the kitchen. I think that's quite common. Um, but actually, I, I can see that actually it's not... Uh, there isn't a huge change in terms of the actual use of the space um but it is definitely a loss of outlook and it should be something we should consider yeah, i think my point was that it, it wasn't the front door it, the front door is on the other side as far as i'm aware well so there's that element of how that how that space is used and why, when you're in that, would the perception of a 2.5 meter brick wall be so harmful to your the amenity of your house, your living condition, that it could be refused by the planning authority? I'm on your side on this one. You know, I, I, I'm just saying that. Yeah, oh. it's, I'm just trying to work out whether it is something we should consider or not. I think with this, it's it's certainly something to consider um, because it has an impact on on the living conditions of the house. I just feel that we feel that it's, it's, its impact is very limited. Okay. I can't see any further indication. So is anybody willing to move the officer's recommendations? I'll look around. If not, then I'm happy to move the officer's recommendation. So I'll just ask if anybody's willing to second that. Oh, Councillor Melly. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so any further debate, Councillor Crosshaw? Yeah, I, I just, I think it's, I always think it's important to sort of explain the way that you are gonna vote. And I, 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 I have concerns about this, I really do on, a couple of things but you know from listening to what's being said and and considering what the legislation says I, I i can't see any strong grounds by which you could refuse it i, I just can't I can, you know I'm, I'm looking for for why you might think about pulling together a, a reason for refusal that would stand up and be robust and and, and I'm, I'm i'm genuinely concerned about the impact that it'll have but i, I just think it would just be lost at, at uh, appeal so I, I will 
on the basis that the legislation is being correctly applied i'll i'll support the approval okay thank you any further if not guys if you're able to give us a summary yes thank you chair so the um the recommendation is that permission be approved subject to the uh, subject to the conditions in the report okay if i could see all those in favor all those against and any abstentions okay okay so that has been approved so thank you very much everybody um there's no urgent business on the agenda so i'll draw the meeting to a close there